Hello, thank you for coming. It's uh, uh, well past uh, pub time, so thank you very much for being here. And I'm not sure if you um, remember me from before. I'm an alumnus. I don't think many of you were even born, I think, when I was a, a student, MSc student here. So um, this was in '94, and I tried to find a, a logo of the Department of Computer Science as it was then. And I couldn't, but I found a picture of our head of department at the time, who was Roland, Roland Ebert. Thank you very much. And uh, at that time, I did an MSc uh, dissertation on LCFG, which is the software that powers your computers, my computers, and essentially everyone's computers um, currently at the university. This was not the case at the time. LCFG was uh, a DCS baby. Uh, at the time, and uh, I worked on some routines together with. One. And? <laughs> Alastair Scobby. Okay, so these, were, these two people were my project supervisors at the time. So uh, that was 94, roll on another 15 years, and Paul Anderson gives me a ring and says, There is this thing called the Idea Lab, and uh, there is a proposal by a guy called Stefan. Uh, that involves sound synthesis and uh, a light sprinkling of maths. Are you up for it? And I said, yes, I'm up for it. And then, three years on, we're involved in a five-year prestigious ERC fellowship. So, well done, Idea Lab. Well done, um, the University of Edinburgh. Because you don't get to see that kind of incubation come to fruition very often. Nor do you get to see that kind of interaction between various departments. But why? Why did Paul call me? He called me because I work for EPCC. Who has heard of EPCC? Who has worked with EPCC? Oh, two. Mm. And this is exactly where I'm going to go in the few minutes that I've got. In that we need to enhance this. We need to improve this, not just between EPCC and other places, but in general in the university. So what do we do? We do HPC research. We do training. We do visitor programs. Uh, we have facilities. We run the UK supercomputer. And we're very heavily involved in European projects and in consultancy projects. We have 70 staff, we have a turnover of 4 million, and mm -hmm. unlike most of the university, we are self-funded. Our money comes in through our work, and this is why um, uh, we keep our uh, colleagues busy uh, through initiatives like <coughs> NETS. Let me give you a, an example of a piece of work that, um, by chance, I was involved in, that had a little bit of a graphic content. So this was called FinGrid, it was funded by the EC, and the idea was to provide a system that uh, enables distributed asset management for the movie industry, the post-production movie industry. <coughs> and uh, this involved a company called JDC, um, who had a long history in such work and were bought in the duration of Filmgrid um, by Panavision. And uh, what we did was we provided a piece of software which helped them um, effectively move from real to digital, as is the way of doing things these days. And moving from um, getting their data across the various actors in that very distributed post-production process to something much more, I don't know, 2010-ish. <laughs> and so the other thing we did for them was um, storyboarding tool. So we went into the offices for the first meeting and we were, we were told, you cannot take pictures, so I can't give you a picture of that, but there was a whiteboard like that one, and it had drawings of scenes. So because I couldn't take pictures, we're using this for any dissemination exercise we do for this. But I can't show you what we did for it instead. So we came up with this software together with them, which allows them to edit the order of how their scenes appear in the movie and experiment with that. Um, it lets them move things about. Um, it lets them see what is available and at what state it is and order with such filters. Um, and uh, it finally lets them edit things. So if, when, when we click on that <coughs> excuse me, sports car, you go into another so software and you can edit things and add things as they do. So this was a very brief overview of how the system worked, just to show you that it doesn't matter that I knew nothing about post-production at the time. 
I was still able to deliver on that. And this is the kind of thing that we tend to do a lot at EPCC. One of our biggest assets is that we are very multicultural and multidisciplinary ourselves. So I am a converted mathematician who did an MSc in computer science, as you heard. My friend James, who works on the project, is a computer scientist. Uh, the other guy who just hired into this work is a physicist. And we've got biologists working on things like that. In the case of film grade, my background didn't quite come into play. But when it makes sense, like it does in the case of James, we do put it into action. We are very good at understanding what the users need and understanding where they come from because of that multicultural, inter interdisciplinary background of our staff. And we run an MSc. If you are involved in an MSc, there is an opportunity for us to work together, uh, doing at least to start with some MSc projects together and, and uh, see how that would work. Uh, we also do training on HPC, on accelerators, we're very good on FPGA, James is the man actually, and on GPUs, uh, as I'll say later, and we do a lot of multi-core computing. Um, we uh, understand project management. We run the center using a, a methodology derived from Prince2. I am Prince2 qualified, something or other. It doesn't really matter. What matters is we understand that projects need to be managed rather than run away. We learned this the hard way 15, 20 years ago before I was hired, and we kept at it, and we tend to transfer that knowledge in all our projects. And we are also very good in user support. Because we have run almost continuously the UK's supercomputers and the user support for the past 20 odd years, we know exactly what the users want, how they phrase it, and how we can get to their needs. We also have a lot, you know, a very high technical background at EPCC. And we do a lot of software development for industry and academia. We don't really do projects for the university itself, so you won't find uh, any of our code running on your desktops or anything like that. We work on consultancy projects. This is our model. Um, we do code optimization, and uh, in this respect, we're very good in GPUs. We recently became an NVIDIA CUDA research center. Uh, on the back of our strength, and this is directly applicable to NES, uh, as you will hear later. Uh, we do a lot of simulation and modeling, we speak a lot of programming languages, um, understand operating systems, understand our architectures, as you would expect from a place like EBCC, a place that has, it is steeped in working with various systems and various uh, actors. And you can get more from our website if you haven't been there before. So, um, I think I'll hand over to Stefan now for some of the more juicy rock and roll things. Thank you for your attention. <coughs> All right, thanks very much, Costas. Um, I'll warn you that we're running on a, a very unfamiliar machine here, so if there are any uh, slip-ups, well, you'll know. Um, so the NEST project, uh, what is it? Well, it is, uh, oh. uh, it's an ERC-funded project uh, that came through the informatics panel, uh, in fact, and it's running, it's been running for just about a year, we'll be running for another four years. And the goal is actually pretty simply stated. It's just to, to try to do uh, digital, to create digital synthetic sound. Um, and we are particularly interested in sound that has a musical character. So what we're not doing is working on, say, sound effects for video games or on environmental sounds. We're really trying to base what we do on um, the instruments of the standard uh, Western orchestra for the most part, um, just because we like those kind of sounds. Um, so what I'll do today is I'll give you a quick run through of um, a whirlwind tour really of just the history of digital sound synthesis and talk a little bit about something called physical modeling. Uh, I'll tell you something about the structure of the project, what we'll be working on, who we'll be working on what. But really I'm kind of more the MC here today rather than the presenter because I'm going to hand it over to the rest of the team who wants doing the real work on the project and they'll do several mini presentations talking about certain topics in more detail. Um, so digital sound synthesis, it's a long-standing attempt uh, to move away from the use of recorded <coughs> sound, um, or sampling as it's better known. And in some ways it's very much analogous to the kinds of things that go on in computer graphics rendering. So you could think about um, I mean, at, at the philosophical level, it is. So 
you can think about the way people used to do effects in films by going out and making a model and filming it as being analogous to sampling, where you go out and record a sound and manipulate that. And you can think about synthesis as analogous to the kinds of things people do now, where they would render things completely synthetically without any um, uh, video or recorded um, images. Um, so the strengths and weaknesses should be pretty evident here. So with a, a model, what you film is always going to look probably slightly better than what you could render, you know, especially things like the movement of people or textures, that kind of thing. Um, but it's a very inflexible way to work because if you've gone out and filmed something and you want to make a, say, a slight change to the angle at which you filmed it, you have to go out and do it again. Whereas in the, in the case of um, synthesis or rendering, it's really just changing a number somewhere in your code. Now, philosophically, sure, they're, they're completely analogous. At the technical level, they're, they have nothing to do with one, one another, I would say. So working with sound is just a very different beast, and I'll try to get to some of the, the differences uh, in a second. OK, um, now just going back uh, to the beginnings here, um, the very first uh, digital sound synthesis algorithms appeared in the kind of late 50s, early 60s. And they were based on um, sort of building blocks that were easy to program and efficient, just because of the constraints on the hardware that people were using at the time. So a couple of well-known examples are, say, additive synthesis, where you would synthesize a sound based on the use of a, a sum of sinusoidal oscillators, or partials, in order to create a complex timbre. Um, another idea, um, which is really pretty, which is quite related actually to the other, is to make use of a buffer filled with data in which you've put, say, one waveform of a sound that you want to play at a given pitch, and then you read through it circularly, so it's great pitch tones. And in fact, I mean, this is, using a wavetable is actually a very simple way to do uh, sinusoidal synthesis, because you might just put, say, one period of a sine wave into the table and through it. Um, now, the big sort of breakthrough was, uh, came in the late 60s where uh, John Chowning at, uh, at Stanford thought it would be a good idea to put the input of one oscillator and use that to draw up the phase of another, giving you a wide variety of tampers for virtually no, uh, no computational cost. So the thing about these methods um, is that they're still here after almost uh, 60 years. Um, so if you go out and buy any sort of standard piece of, uh, of music software, you're going to find these kind of um, building blocks within it. Um, they're popular because they're conceptually very simple. Um, some of them can be very efficient as well, particularly wavetable synthesis. Now there are difficulties too in working this way. Um, one of them has to do with control. So if you imagine trying to build a sound out of a lot of sinusoids or partials, um, in theory of course you can produce any conceivable sound, but in practice um, you have a lot of work to do in going in and specifying uh, all the amplitudes and phases and frequencies of all the partials, which is a lot to ask of a, of a musician. Um, the other difficulty, and I kind of hesitate to call it a difficulty because it's really more a matter of taste, is that the sounds produced this way are invariably uh, quite artificial. So here's a couple of FM samples. Um, this is a, a trumpet. <laughs> And here's a bell-like sound. So these are, I mean, this is old stuff. This was the kind of thing that was produced in the early 70s. Um, and it became possible to do this real time by the, the late 70s, in fact. So, um, so there's, there's virtually no computing involved in, in doing this kind of sound, which is, would become very different when we start looking at physical modeling. OK. Um, Physical modeling evolved as a response to some of these difficulties. Um, so instead of basing uh, sound synthesis on building blocks that are efficient or easy to program, they are based on physical principles. So here, for example, you have a model of a drum, um, which is made up of two membranes, uh, which are attached by a rigid shell. And the entire object is then immersed in the acoustic field, both inside the, the cavity and without. So physical modeling uh, ultimately then would be doing a, a full simulation of such an object in order to get sound out. Um, so the hope is that the sound will be realistic, 
uh, in the sense, not in the sense that it may, it may exactly duplicate the sound of an existing instrument. Mm -hmm. We're not so interested in that. But in the sense that sounds produced this way should sound as though they could have been produced uh, acoustically somehow by an object which we may not be able to build, some virtual instrument. Um, the big benefit is probably in terms of control, I would say, because instead of setting, you know, potentially hundreds or thousands of parameters, which may be of, uh, of very little uh, sort of intuitive significance for a musician, you're really setting numbers that you can get a handle on. So things like the, in order to build this drum, for example, you might say uh, what the radius of the drum is, you might say what the membrane is made of, and to play it, you might say, well, I'd like to hit it here at this particular location, this hard, uh, and at this particular time. Mm -hmm. So it's very easy for musicians to work in this kind of framework. Um, now, there is, because physical modeling is actually pretty expensive, um, there's been a lot of hybridization recently. So if you go and look at the new uh, uh, range of digital pianos out there, they're no longer samplers, in fact. Um, they use physical modeling to deal with the easy parts of the sound. So for a piano, the easy part is doing the string. And for the harder bits, like say the soundboard, what they'll do is they'll go out and take a hammer, knock on the soundboard, measure the impulse response, and then run everything through that. So it's used for the, the easy parts, and then but they rely on sampling for the harder bits. So it's just a bit like the kind of thing you might do in in motion capture, say, where the you know the harder bits to render, say the motion, the complex motion of a human body or motion of a face, you wouldn't want to try to synthesize that. You'd rather take that from a live performer. Okay, um, so the methods that uh, have appeared to do physical modeling over the years are very, several families of them. The earliest large scale attempt at it was, uh, is based on the use of lumped mass spring networks, um, coupled with some differential equation solver. Uh, and this was the basis for something called the Cordis system, which first appeared in uh, 1979. And it's kind of an abstract approach to physical modeling, um, because you're building things out of uh, masses and springs, it's kind of difficult to deal with uh, real objects, so something like, say, a curved metal plate. It might be kind of hard to do this way. Um, but it does kind of offer an extreme degree of control to the musician. So you have control over all the fine details, like all the, where the masses and springs are and what they interact with, etc. And they produce a, a fairly okay sound, actually, for given uh, the time at which it appeared. So here's a cymbal-like sound, and here's a Tiffany drum. So these are both from the early 80s, I think. Um, okay, another approach, uh, much more um, rigorous actually, is to take your object and decompose the dynamics into modes, each of which oscillates at a given natural frequency. And if you have such a decomposition at hand, you can then um, rebuild the sound partial by partial or frequency by frequency by adding together the responses of your object at whatever listening point you've chosen. Um, so this was developed at IRCOM in France in the mid-80s um, and has um, become the basis for something called the Modalis system. And sounds are, I think, somewhat better in quality. This is kind of a selection of sort of various sounds that they have up on their on the IRCOM website. <coughs> Um, probably the most successful method to date, though, has been the digital waveguide technique, um, which uh, is yet another approach to, uh, to physical modeling. It's based now on a traveling wave decomposition of the dynamics of a vibrating object. Um, so this was developed at Stanford, um, and it kind of is, has its roots, though, in some of the methods that were used in, uh, in speech early on, Kelly Lockdown methods. Um, which are based on wave propagation, it's transmission line-like structures. Um, these, however, are very efficient, but targeted. So they're targeted towards systems which have um, satisfy certain rather strict hypotheses. So the hypotheses are that wave propagation is at constant speed, wave propagation is distortionless, and that waves do not interact. And if you have such a picture, um, it's immediate, in fact, to get to a very efficient implementation in terms of two uh, delay lines which, uh, which transport data to the left and right just like waves. And if you want to get a sound out, what you would then do is add together the waves at a given point along the object. So virtually no arithmetic, except moving a pointer around. 
Um, but then targeted towards certain families of instruments. So strings can do really well, and also uh, simple acoustic tubes, so cylinders and cones are also uh, a good match to this methodology. So here's a guitar-like um, waveguide sound. Okay, um, then what do you do though if things, the, the, the system you're looking at really doesn't satisfy any of these hypotheses, if you don't have a traveling wave decomposition, if you don't have a modal decomposition? Well, I mean the obvious thing to do, and I think if you were a mechanical engineer looking at this problem, the thing you would say immediately is, well why not just go and simulate it directly using a recursion operating over a grid? I mean that's what, that's what it has been going on for you know, 60, 70 years in, in that area. Um, and why not indeed, actually? Uh, it's a good way to, to be able to approach virtually any system, so it's very general. Um, and it also has been used, though not really for synthesis, but within musical acoustics. So people who do experimental work on, say, drums or uh, brass instruments will tend to work this way, even though they're not really interested in doing synthesis so much. Um, however, um, it's certainly not true that you can go out and get some standard package for doing simulation, something like Comsol or something, and you know, design your, your instrument and, and hope that it's going to be able to produce good sound, just because there are a lot of constraints that are uh, really particular to working with audio, and I'll get to those in a second. Okay, um, now before I get to the, the fiddly bits of uh, designing numerics for audio, let me just show you what we're going to be working on throughout the course of this project. So we've identified several um, target systems and we've chosen them because they span the range of, of instruments in the orchestra. We haven't hit them all but we've got sort of one from each major family. And also because they're difficult to approach uh, using other techniques. So one family that we're very interested in just because there's been a long history of work in this area at Edinburgh and in the acoustics group is brass. Um, so here we are looking at wave propagation in tubes. We're looking at um, nonlinear effects also in propagation in tubes, so shock wave uh, formation. We're looking at um, dealing with uh, simulation of the boundary layer, and we're also looking at movable components, so things like valves or slides of instruments. So here's a, um, a finite difference uh, trumpet sound. <laughs> So you might say, well, you put some reverb on that. Uh, and in fact, we did, but we did it physically. So in fact, Craig Webb, who's sitting in the front row here, and we'll talk a little bit later, uh, ran this sound through a, a large acoustic space at an audio rate. And it took, I forget how many hours to compute, but... Uh, five. Five hours yeah. per second, or is it? Uh, no, for the whole, for five seconds. Oh, that's not too bad. Yeah. Okay, anyway, we'll get back to that in a bit. Um, uh, another family we'll be looking at is the family of electromechanical instruments. So if you're a fan of pop music from the you know, 60s, 70s, you, you will certainly know the sounds of the Rhodes piano and the clavinet, even if you, uh, if you don't recognize those names. Um, Stevie Wonder was the, probably the biggest practitioner of these instruments. Um, so these have all sorts of interesting features. They're, they're sort of hybrid mechanical uh, instruments with an electrical transduction element to them. So they're mechanical in their action, but they have pickups in them. Um, we haven't actually gotten to this part of the project yet. That's in year three, I think, we'll be into this. So I'll move on to plate and shell vibration. So we are very interested in percussion, um, particularly percussion based on uh, vibration of metal plates, um, so curved <coughs> or flat. And in particular, in high amplitude effects, nonlinear effects. And this is something that Alberto Torn will be talking about in a second. But here's a gong type sound. And here's a cymbal. OK, so beyond um, actual uh, instrument families that correspond to things that really exist, we're also interested in building environments that musicians can use, um, which do not correspond to anything in the real world. So this is an environment um, based on the use of uh, coupled plates. So you would go out and specify how many of these you want and what connections you would like among them, and then you need to write a score for them. Um, so here's an excerpt from a piece that was done 
in MATLAB, I might add, in, in 12 channels uh, about four years ago by a composer from Ireland. Now the, um, the granddaddy of all systems uh, in musical acoustics is uh, the concert hall. And so this is a, a problem of, you know, of computation even order of orders of magnitude more than, uh, uh, more than the, the other systems we'll be looking at. Um, and I will leave this topic because I think Craig and Brian are going to be talking about this in a bit. Um, and beyond just looking at uh, the responses of halls, we're also interested in trying to put all of our instruments into halls. So have them actually uh, be fully embedded with the environment so that we can, we can listen to the sounds they produce in any way we like. So we can place virtual microphones around them uh, and pick up the responses anywhere. Okay, um, just a few technical considerations now. Um, a basic constraint in audio is the choice of the sample rate. Um, and here are some constraints that appear in the, in the audio world which don't really appear in the, in the standard world of numerical simulation. So one is that we absolutely must choose the sample rate to be high enough to be able to render anything which we could possibly hear, which means more than uh, about 40 kilohertz. Um, so, you know, some of the benefits of numerical methods, say designing schemes that are more efficient because they use larger time steps, are unavailable to us. Um, another constraint, which is more desirable rather than a constraint, is that we don't want to be rendering audio above this range. So we don't want to be running our algorithms at, say, a megahertz, because um, we will be generating audio or audio signals that we will not be able to hear, or acoustic signals that we will not be able to hear. Um, so the time step is small. So there's a lot of computational work to do. So we're operating, you know, we're our recursions run at 40,000 times at least a second compared to video, say, which is 25 to 50. Um, and simulations are long. So these simulations run for 100,000, a million time steps. So there are other issues that come up when you start to run things for this long. You need to worry about stability. I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about numerical design from an audio perspective um, because a lot of things are upside down. So let's just consider um, a model of a string. So if you're operating at a given sample rate, a time step, there are many choices you have, of, uh, there are various choices of, of what the spacing can be between the points at which you want to simulate the solution. So what I've got here are three different arrangements of points. So one very dense, which turns out to be the optimal one, and then a couple that are less dense by a factor of two uh, each way. So in the numerics world, or in this mainstream numerics world, these are sometimes viewed as being advantageous because there are fewer points, less computational work to do. And yet, what happens um, is this. So here's what happens if you listen to the sound of a string at the um, at the optimal spacing. It's a very basic model. Uh, and if you change the spacing by a factor of two, and then by four, you get that. So you start to hear artifacts. Um, and there are four separate artifacts you can hear in this last sample. I'll go through them one by one. Um, first one is clearly there's a low passing effect. Uh, so this is duller, this sound. And in fact, if you look at the spectrum here, even though we're running at, uh, at 44.1 kilohertz, we're only getting about three kilohertz of usable bandwidth. So this is an extremely inefficient algorithm. Another effect you hear is kind of a strange distortion in the sound. So it's sort of a roughness. It almost sounds like clipping or digital distortion of some kind. It isn't. Um, what's happened is that these partials in the optimal sound have all gotten squished into this very small range around here. In fact, they start to step on each other's toes in terms of lying within the same critical band, which you hear as roughness. So it's a psychoacoustic effect. Um, another effect is that of the attack. So the attack is 
very uh, sort of smeared, actually, compared to this attack, which is an effect um, of decoherence of waves due to something called numerical dispersion in the system. And then finally, if you listen carefully, um, there's a little chirp at the end, too, which is also an effect of numerical dispersion. So these are the kind of things that we you know, are killing ourselves trying to avoid uh, hearing. Um, okay, and just one other example on numerical dispersion. Another type of artifact uh, has to do with tuning, actually. So if, let's just take the case, say, of a vibrating bar model. So this corresponds, say, to a, um, a xylophone. And what I've got here is a plot of, which I'm sure you can barely see, but it's a, a plot of something called the phase velocity. So this is the velocity at which waves travel in this medium as a function of frequency. The blue curve is the uh, phase velocity for the model. Yellow is what we get when we run a very simple numerical method. So it's too slow numerically. And we hear this, in fact, as a detuning. So that's the model system. Oh, other way around. That's the model system. And that's the numerical scheme. So you hear this detuning of under a semitone, which is not good, of course. Um, so we're trying to avoid these things. Um, so we need to be really careful of the designs we use. So we can't just go out and use the simplest method available. We have to do some work uh, to try to reduce this effect. And often, this interferes with the kind of work we're trying to do at EPCC in parallelizing this. So we end up having to use, say, methods that use um, uh, linear system solves, say, which are uh, bad, you know, generally. Okay, um, and then there's instability. So this is a, um, a critical concern for the kind of work that we do. Um, uh, especially if we're going to be giving our, our algorithms to, um, uh, to non-experts, to musicians. So these come up all over the place. Here's an example of an instability, linear instability in a membrane. So what you can see is this solution kind of exploding exponentially. It becomes very jagged and then it explodes. And also in the, uh, the non-linear setting. So here is an example of shockwave propagation in a tube. This is the kind of thing you might see in a trombone bore. Um, so wave steepening effects. And as the waves become steeper and steeper, there's a point at which the grid doesn't have enough resolution to be able to support them anymore. And the algorithm rebels uh, and becomes unstable. So linear instability is not too hard to deal with. The nonlinear part, uh, nonlinear stability analysis is harder. We have ways of dealing with it, but we need to always be careful um, that we don't compromise audio output. So um, another example of how this comes up is in a modular civics. So suppose we're allowing a musician to design his or her own instrument. Um, well, problems can arise there too. So just consider two very simple systems, say a mass spring system and an ideal string, both linear. Um, sometimes uh, when you design an algorithm, you may be able to get it to work stably. So the system works as it's expected to do. Sometimes, though, what you see are instabilities appearing um, generally locally, so at the point of contact of the two systems. Um, and as you can imagine, the difficulties become compounded when you're working not with just two systems, but maybe hundreds of them. Uh, so we need to have a framework in order to attack this. Um, the way we work in the group um, is by using Hamiltonian-based methods. So in our codes, um, we have a numerical energy, at least in the lossless case, conserved to machine accuracy. So here's the case of a um, trumpet, say in the lossless case, and I have a little plot here of the energy. And the energy, in fact, is, I mean, you're seeing variations there, but actually those are variations of a single bit. So that's why it's quantized there. So we build this in as a measure into all of our code. And in fact, um, this gives us a stability guarantee, and it's also a really good debugging tool. Because once we've built this in, we can kind of monitor this energy. If there's any kind of bug, it will appear as some kind of variation there. Okay, and then finally, um, this is my last slide here, computational costs. Um, audio sample rates are high. Uh, and normally, uh, flop rates and memory requirements go with some power of the sample rate. So we really need to keep these low if at all possible. But even when they are low, say at 48 kilohertz, um, you can estimate 
what the operation counts will be. So they tend to be, what I've got here is kind of a plot of operations per, uh, per second output. And here's about where, uh, what you can do in real time with a uh, standard uh, single core. And what you find is that, you know, of course, they kind of scale mainly as dimension. So 1D objects or something like a, a horn is relatively simple to do. Once you start getting up into 2D, though, looking at, say, nonlinear plates and shells, or very large sets of 1D objects, then it gets more expensive. And then finally, there's kind of an explosion. So looking at trying to do something like a concert hall is very, very expensive indeed. Um, so these are not the kind of things you can run on in MATLAB anymore. Um, so we are interested in musical use for these systems. So we want compute times to be uh, if not real-time, reasonable. And what we're looking at in conjunction with EPCC is um, GPU implementation to speed these up because you know, they are uh, somewhat parallelizable, uh, a lot of the methods that we're using. Um, and at this point, I would like to uh, let the rest of the team introduce themselves. They're each going to talk for about four to five minutes, I think. Um, and I'll let them, actually, in fact, I'll let them introduce themselves. Uh, so first up is Brian. Uh, <coughs> all right. So I'm Brian Hamilton, and uh, my part of the project concerns uh, simulating 3D room acoustics. So the I mean a room is basically a space surrounded by walls and a wave. Um, is a spatial field that changes over time. So a field, you can think about it like temperature. Temperature is a field. You have um, a value at every point in time, and it can change. I mean, in a room, it generally doesn't change. But So you can think about a wave as a, as a field, and sound propagates as a pressure wave. So at each point in time, you have a pressure, and these values change over time. So simulating sound wave propagation comes down to choosing some grid of points in space, calculating the sound pressure at each point, and iterating in time. So some of the problems that um, we're trying to solve are how to do this as, a, as efficiently as possible, because you've seen that the computational problem is quite large. Um, if there's any audible artifacts, how do we minimize them? Sorry, well, those are the, those are the two that I'm going to talk about right now. So. First is the choice of the spatial lattice. Um, the basic one that we choose is the cubic lattice. Um, points are arranged in a, as corners of a cube. It's, it's the most easy lattice to use because that's how generally how computer memory is decomposed. Um, this is another lattice. It's called the face center cubic lattice. Um, there's many choices. This one's called body centered cubic. And this one's um, called the diamond lattice because it's the structure of the diamond crystal. So the way we want to choose it is based on how waves should propagate in, in physically, and waves propagate uniformly in every direction. Um, so symmetry turns out to be the key factor here. And so the face center cubic lattice has the most rotational symmetry, um, which is why it turns out to be a, a good choice and you might recognize it because it solves another problem, which is how to pack spheres in 3D with the closest density of spheres. So otherwise, um, you know, this is how you would stack fruit, a grocer would stack fruit. So this, this leads to uh, the numerical dispersion in the scheme. So numer numerical dispersion, as Stefan said, leads to uh, phase velocity or wave speed error. And <coughs> The simulated waves propagate along the axes of the grid. So this is, this is a 2D example with a square grid. And you can see that, well, these arrows represent the wave somehow, but you can see that it, it propagates along the grid. So there ends up being um, a wave speed that depends on the grid, as well as frequency. So this is an example of a, a wave, a simple wave front, which is um, a circular wave that is propagating without dispersion, or with minimal dispersion, you can see that the wave front is, is held, kept together. Um, 
And now this is an example with dispersion. What you'll see is that the wave spreads apart and also you can see there's a directional dependent component. So you can see that it, it has an axial dependence and the wave is spreading apart into many different waves. So that's numerical dispersion and we want to avoid that. Um, another thing is if we have error we would like it to be direction independent. Um, it's not because this is going to sound better but because we can use this to, to cancel out the error, the wave speed error, um, by using a delicate cancellation of time and space error. So the, the, um, the wave speed error in 3D, well this is a, a spatial frequency domain, um, but basically it's a surface and it kind of takes the shape of the lattice. So that in the cubic lattice you end up getting a kind of cubic shape. Um, on the face in a cubic lattice you have a, a truncated octahedron so it's almost like a soccer ball and you can see that it ends up being much rounder in fact it's not spherical but it's it's almost spherical and then with the body centered cubic lattice you get a, a rhombic dodecahedron so this is another way to see how the face in a cubic lattice um, is advantageous and this is uh, this is just an animation to show you um, that they're actually all related, so you can go from one to the other, and um, in between you can see that we pass through a sphere, and then this one's the closest one to the sphere. So now I'm going to play some examples of what the dispersion sounds like. So this is um, this is a castanet sample, which is a standard audio industry um, sample they use for audio coding. So this is a clean sound without any reverberation. And this is, so there's no echoes in this sound that's going to play next, but it's a direct sound that's coming at you with dispersion. So this is what it sounds like. So that's actually a pretty large effect. That's, I mean, if we were running a standard scheme, um, at an audio rate and you were listening at a distance of 10 meters in the worst direction, that's what you would actually hear. So this is clearly not acceptable if we're going to do concert halls. So this example is a guitar and then you hear the same effect. So depending on the sound you can hear less or more of it but, but we generally go with the, um, the worst case scenarios and, and the casting happens to be one of the worst. Okay, so that's all I'll talk about, and next is Alberto. Okay, so I'm um, Alberto Torin, and um, I work on percussion instruments. Um, from the physical point of view, uh, we can divide percussion instruments into two families, so to say, so membranes, uh, on the left and uh, plates and shells on the right so membranes obviously related uh, with many types of drums and plates and shells with uh, gongs and cymbals uh, we can also find uh, two different regimes uh, linear and non-linear that depend on how uh, we strike this, this instrument and, and today we will concentrate on the right side of the, of the chart so we'll start from linear plates. Mm, this is the equation. So what's the, what does linear mean? So if, if we excite the plate uh, with the first mode, for example, we see that the system continues to vibrate uh, in the same way, possibly forever. Um, so in other words, there's no uh, interaction between different modes. There's no energy exchange between different modes. So this is how they would sound like. So bear in mind this sound and we'll compare it to uh, nonlinear plates. Try it, please. Yeah. So uh, we can add um, nonlinear terms to the previous equation and uh, we obtain uh, the so called von Karman equations for nonlinear plates. 
and these by the way reduce to the previous one in the limited low excitations um, so this time what happens uh, if uh, if we take the same plate but and we excite it again with the first mode uh, we see that many other modes become excited as well uh, the, the, the shape changes <coughs> therefore we can say that there that this time there <coughs> is an energy exchange between different modes um, there are also other phenomena that appear uh, like crashes and pitch glide effects and uh, we can hear them from this sound the plate is the same but the sound is really different um, of course these plates uh, do not live in a vacuum so uh, we, we want to embed them uh, in, in, in air so they interact with air uh, so we, we take the previous equations, we add uh, the pressure, the air pressure, we introduce the acoustic field um, that simulates the air, uh, and then of course we add uh, coupling terms between the air and the plate, and this is what we get. Um, so this is the full system, uh, plate plus air. So, so far we talked about the continuous equations of the system, but when it comes to numerically implement them, <coughs> one must pay attention to stability and energy issues, energy conservation issues, as Steph and, and Brian pointed out before. But this time we, had an, we have an additional problem. So uh, the only stable algorithm that we have uh, requires to solve a huge sparse linear system in the loop, so at each and every time step, uh, and this must uh, this can be computationally really heavy uh, if done with a backslash operator, say in MATLAB. Uh, so uh, we found we, we we searched for other approaches, and we found an iterative solver that works well uh, for the the simple plate. And with some addi ad additional work, and uh, work well, works well as well for the um, when air is present. So I will conclude my presentation with um, with a, a virtual instrument that we <coughs> created. So one can embed uh, several plates, uh, three in this case, in a in a box of air, um, and. W we can see from, from, the, from the movie how the pressure propagates from the first plate and propagates throughout the box while the energy of the system on the upper right part remains constant to machine accuracy and there is obviously an exchange of energy between the plate and the air so this is, uh, this is for example uh, a roll gesture that we can obtain with such a with such an instrument. And this is an, an example of several uh, random strikes. So even if um, we found a way to, to speed up a bit the code in MATLAB. Um, the computation is still quite expensive. So, for example, the first one took a full day of computation in MATLAB to, 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 uh, to be obtained. So, I guess we really need to port these kind of codes into C and then CUDA um, in order to get you know, reasonable amount of, of time. For the computation, so I'll guess I'll pass on to to James that will explain a bit uh, about this issue. So, thanks. Thanks. Well, I'm James Perry. Um, I work for EPCC with Costas, and 
my role on the project is basically to optimise things and get them to run as fast as possible. Uh, so I'm going to talk a lot about GPUs. And this is the uh, primary way in which we're uh, getting high performance out of these codes at the moment. Um, GPU stands for Graphics Processing Unit, uh, and as the name suggests, these were originally designed for rendering 3D graphics very fast. Um, but in recent years, there's been a lot of interest also in using them for general purpose computation, um, particularly scientific and uh, simulation type uh, algorithms. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as GPGPU. Um, and in fact, they're very well suited for certain problems, including some of the problems we're dealing with on the NEST project. Um, because um, in graphics, you tend to have to perform very simple calculations, but you have to do them thousands or millions of times on different data points. Um, when rendering a scene, you have to perform the same or very similar calculations on all the vertices, and then same or similar calculations on all the pixels being rendered to the screen. Um, and in our 3D room simulations in particular, we have to perform very simple computations, but do them very many times, and uh, very many times per time step, in fact. So GPUs are actually quite well suited for, for these. So uh, I'll talk a bit about the porting process, how we go from the original model codes to, to something that runs faster. Uh, so. The, the codes were originally written in MATLAB. Uh, MATLAB's very good for sort of fast prototyping. Uh, it's excellent for developing the code that's making modifications to them quickly and has all kinds of um, facilities for trying things out, for visualization and so on. Um, but the performance tends to leave a lot to be desired. Um, and we've, you know, Alberto talks about having to leave it running all day to get uh, that sound sample out. So. Clearly we'd like it to run faster. Um, and the first thing I'll do when I get hold of a new MATLAB code is to port it to, to C rather than directly to the GPU. Um, and this has a number of advantages already. C um, tends to run faster than MATLAB if it's well written. Uh, it'll run anywhere. Um, so on any machine you don't need MATLAB installed. But uh, it's still easier to debug and modify than CUDA. Uh, and it makes a good basis for the CUDA port. A lot of the code can actually be shared. Uh, just as an aside, I should explain what CUDA is. Um, CUDA is um, NVIDIA's technology for programming GPUs doing general purpose computations on them. Uh, out of all the various methods for programming GPUs, it's probably the most mature and high performance at present. It does have uh, the slight downside that you're restricted to NVIDIA hardware if you use CUDA. Um, this isn't too much of a problem for us since most of the machines we've been using uh, have NVIDIA hardware exclusively and also we want to build our own machines so we can make sure that we get whatever hardware we need and can make use of the best software available. Um, so after C I will, I will port to CUDA and CUDA is, is based on C so it's it's a good starting point for the, the porting. Um, and some code will remain in C. Um, generally only the time critical main loop, the, the code that runs each time step will be ported to CUDA because that's what makes the difference to the performance. It's not generally worth porting things like startup code that only run once because it doesn't have a big impact on overall performance. And once it's in CUDA, um, we will then optimize the CUDA to get as high a performance as we can. Uh, the whole point of putting it to GPU is to get the performance. Um, I've said as far as possible there because initially we don't always know, you know quite how, how good performance we're going to get. It depends a lot on the individual codes. And some of it you can't necessarily predict. You just have to measure what, what happens. But we, we aim as far as possible for, for high performance. Um, and at each stage of this process, running down the, the diagram, uh, we'll verify that the code still gives the same results. Um, we've got various means of doing this. We can check that the, the output from the code matches to uh, a certain number of significant digits. Um, 
you can't always get an absolute match because the technologies can be too different, the order of operations can be too different and so on. Um, but I've seen uh, the same C program running on two architectures give different results. So obviously between MATLAB and CUDA you can't always expect identical results, but we want it to be close enough. Um, and we can check the energy conservation that uh, Stefan talked about uh, earlier on as well, to make sure that still holds for all the, the different versions. So I'm going to give an example of the speed up we got on, on one of the codes. This is quite a sort of preliminary result. This is the uh, the 3D ABC code. Um, it's it's one of Brian's codes, one of the 3D room acoustics type codes. Uh, it simulates a 3D box of air with, with various different conditions at the boundaries. Um, so this was a fairly small run, um, so that we could run the map lab without it taking too long. So it takes, it took 31 seconds in the original map lab code. Uh, the port C was reduced to under half a second, or 70 times faster than the map lab already. Um, and the CUDA reduced the run time even further to a fraction of a second, uh, nearly 400 times faster than the original map lab. Um, in fairness to MATLAB, I should say that the MATLAB version here wasn't optimised. It was uh, you know, written more for, for clarity than, than anything else. Um, as I said, this was a fairly small size simulation. Um, on the, as the simulation size increases, you tend to get a better speed up from C to CUDA. Um, the larger the simulation, generally, the better performance you'll get out of CUDA relatively because there are certain fixed costs that you have to pay even for small simulations. Um, and also, I, sh I should say, um, it's inherently difficult to compare the performance of these things because you basically you can't run them all on the same hardware because CUDA only runs on GPUs and MATLAB and C will only run on CPUs. So you can't compare them like for like exactly. All you could really do is say, um, this is uh, the performance you'd get on a typical CPU system, and this is the performance on a typical GPU system. So the MATLAB and C were on a fairly standard single core CPU, and the CUDA is timed on a, on a fairly standard single NVIDIA GPU card. Um, well, I'm now going to pass over to Brian, um, not Brian, sorry. No. <laughs> Craig, who's going to uh, talk to you a bit more about uh, GPUs and, and so on. Okay. Okay, so my part of the project um, concerns the computation of very large scale virtual acoustics. Uh, we create an environment and we simulate the way that sound propagates in the space in three dimensions. Now, this has applications to things like gaming, uh, to film, to architectural acoustics, uh, virtual reality, as well as audio synthesis. So these are dynamic simulations where we're uh, modeling four-wave behavior. Um, we can kind of use it in two different ways. We can either inject uh, dry pre-recorded audio into the simulation to get like a re reverberation effect or an oralization. Um, or we can embed virtual instruments into the space, as we've seen before. Okay, so um, I do want to talk a bit about the, the computation size here, because it's kind of important. Um, now, these types of 3D simulations are very computationally heavy. Uh, typically, we want to run at a sample rate of 44.1 kilohertz. Uh, and this gives us a grid spacing, which is like 13 and a half millimeters. So for a one cubic meter space, we need a cube like this with 75 by 75 by 75 grid points. And this is 422,000 grid points for one cubic meter. Now each point is updated using around 10 floating point operations. And the entire grid needs updating 44,100 times to get one second of output. So that's around 185 giga uh, floating point operations. Now, to do 2,000 cubic meters requires 370 tera operations, just to get one second. If you want to do a 10 second simulation, um, you're talking about 3.7 peta operations. 
So this is like 3.7 times 10 to the 15 floating point operations. Now clearly we need to do some serious uh, acceleration here to make this usable. And we do this by using uh, multiple GPU cards at the same time. So we can typically use uh, four cards in the server simultaneously. And we, using this we can get a speed up of in the range of kind of like 100 to 140 over running it uh, just in serial code on a desktop machine. So this gets us from something that takes like five days in serial C code to something that takes around about an hour and requires about 10 gig of memory at a single precision. So we have some audio examples of the 2000 cubic meter hall. So first off, this is um, just a very dry uh, guitar input sound. And this is what we get from the output of the simulation. And some more guitars. Input and this is the output. Okay. And next up, we have uh, this is an anechoic recording of an opera singer, so recorded in a, an anechoic chamber. And next we have the output from the simulation. Okay. So um, as these uh, simulations are dynamic, if you have a big enough space and uh, you move the sounds uh, quick enough during the simulation, you can actually get the uh, Doppler effect. So uh, this is uh, like an input, it's like a siren. And this is what we get when we move that siren sound through the simulation space uh, during the runtime. So, yeah, you can just about hear the, the Doppler effect there. Okay, so those simulations were done uh, by injecting uh, dry audio samples into this simulation of the room. But the other thing we can do, obviously, is to use uh, we can embed three-dimensional uh, models of instruments into these large-scale uh, virtual simulations. So uh, the timpani drum is a good test case for this. Uh, we use a 2D uh, nonlinear membrane, which is coupled to, to the airspace. And then we use a parabolic shell uh, with fixed boundaries. So the system is designed to be uh, modular, so we can create any number of these timpani drums inside the simulation space. And we have some examples here. So the first is just a single timpani drum. And then we have two timpani drums. And then three. Finally, we've got four timpani drums being played at the same time on quite a large scale, uh, something like the 2,000 cubic meter space. Okay, uh, so that's my part of the project, and I'm going to hand back to Stefan. Okay, uh, I know we're way over time, so I'm going to compress these down into under a minute if I can. Um, so I've talked about two sides of the project. One is the algorithm design. Uh, one is the, uh, the acceleration, the parallel computing side. But there's also a third, which we haven't uh, actually started with yet, which has to do with um, creative use of all this stuff. Um, so what we'll be building <coughs> is musical instruments, musical environments uh, for musicians to work with. Um, and we're going to be inviting uh, eight 
composers uh, to come to Edinburgh to learn how to use these through workshops. And to this end, we're just putting together now a new uh, multi-channel listening space in the basement of uh, Morrison Place in UCA. Um, so it's, uh, it's kind of tricky. I mean, there are things to learn here uh, about how to play these. I mean, it's one thing to come up with an algorithm. To actually figure out how to get the best sound out of it is, um, is just like learning a real instrument. So particularly for something like, say, a brass instrument. Um, you know, when you play around with these algorithms, the first sounds you get out tend to sound like the sounds you'd produce if you were eight, you know. Um, um, but you do get better uh, at them, slowly. Okay. Um, so that's the creative side. We haven't really done much on it yet, so, uh, so I'm not going to say too much more about it. But what is starting to loom on the horizon is the control side. So that NES is an audio-only project. Uh, we are not really making any serious attempt to, to build live performable <coughs> instruments, just because it's premature. I mean, the stuff we're doing is not real-time. I don't think it will be real-time in the next few years. And yet, in order to, to be able to use these, you need to have some kind of rudimentary interface. And even that is a, is a tricky affair. Um, so at the moment, I mean, we have composers typing in uh, numbers into arrays, uh, into, say, MATLAB codes or CUDA codes, um, which is, you know, it's OK if you have a technically savvy musician. Not so great if, if, uh, if you don't. Um, so. Uh, so the subsequent levels of work are, first of all, going to be figuring out how to characterize the, the control of these objects in a nice, efficient, uh, parsimonious way. And then eventually we'll probably get around to doing some kind of UI design. But uh, again, this is future work. So uh, that's that. And I have uh, a slide that says, uh, do you have any questions? Thank you very much. We can all take questions, I suppose. Yeah, John. Um, I'm not quite sure if I fully understood um, what Craig was talking about just in the last the, the, the last little bit. Can you are you actually coupling these these models of space with models of instruments so that they have some kind of feedback in, in interaction? Is that what the that's, last that's exactly the case? Yeah. yeah. So the whole point of this is to do uh, three dimensional physical modeling. So we take the, the membrane in the temporary case, and it's actually coupled to the air above and below it. So yeah, when it vibrates, the, yeah, the sound is radiated through uh, the air space simulation as well. And, and is there there's feedback back from the air space? Exactly. The instrument yeah, so it's, it's a two-way. Yeah, it's a two-way uh, transfer of energy between those two systems. So for instance, one if you have two temperatures next to one another, if you hit one, it'll set the other one in motion. Mm -hmm. So. Any other questions yet? Yeah. How many years do you reckon it will be to be <laughs> doing polyphonic stuff in real time? Uh, I have no idea. I mean, you know, I used to say, like I did a talk five years ago where I was saying, I think I said that in order to do something big, like the Royal Festival Hall, it would, you know, according to Moore's Law, it would be possible in the year 2035 or something. But right. I was wrong about that one. I mean, we're getting close to doing big... Well, if you use... Maybe real time, yeah, sure. But, if you use the but, wells... Uh, Fastest supercomputer at the moment, which is the Titan machine. That has. Um, you could do that, yeah. And he has like 20 petaflop performance. So if you somehow manage to get, extract all the performance out of that, you could do like 4,000, 5,000 cubic meters of space. Yeah, like a big uh, like a, a big room. Like I think Royal Festival, you can figure out that the operation count is about uh, 10 petaflops or something. Uh, so in order to to get sound out in real time, so it's big. Um, and with regard to the instruments, I mean, I know you have Oh, the instruments, yeah, it depends. I mean, it depends on what you're talking about. If it's a brass instrument, yeah, I think that'll be real time. I mean, uh, probably easily, I would say. Um, other ones, the plate stuff, probably not. Uh, but not too far, we hope, by the end of the project. So it's the 3D that really gets you. Uh, everything else seems like not too far away. But. Is there a trade-off then between um, when you're talking about you're really talking about cubic space? Yeah. So, for example, uh, in the middle of a project in, in acoustics, as you know, using the reverb room, which has got a long, long reverb time, but that's not a function. You can model that as a very small physical space, so that wouldn't be as costly in terms of computing power to model something which is physically small but yet has a very long reverb time. You could definitely see that yeah, by ramping up the reflections. Obviously, yeah. you can make a small space very reverberous, 
that's, that's, that's but it, w it won't have the right um, kind of mode density though like it won't be as even you know like that's the thing about a small space you need the you need a big volume just to get the right density of mode up high there's no way around it really but, but what so. I mean is the actual com the cost in the computing power is this is this the physical space you're trying to model yeah it's independent yeah. actually of the amount of time it takes to to die off it's a separate issue so uh, yeah. Um. Uh, so, so I see people using GPUs a lot. Is, do you think it's really is the case that the, the audio situation is sufficiently different from, from the graphical one that somebody should be designing an you know, APU and not even? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, actually, let me, what do you guys think? I don't really, I don't program for the, the GPU. I do MATLAB only, so I'll leave it to these guys. Well, I guess we, at present there probably wouldn't be a big enough market for it because a lot of what's currently done on audio, like the sample-based methods, is computationally trivial enough that you can do it on a CPU without any mm -hmm. trouble. But I guess if the physical modeling really took off and you know, wanting chips to put inside future synthesizers, I mean, who knows? I think they'd be, they'd be pretty similar to GPUs, I think, because mm -hmm. it is fundamentally um, performing a lot of very simple operations you know, many, many times. So I think if they did design such a thing, I think it would be very similar to what we can do. So, so and this is why they won't, I think. So if I could add another coefficient to that, because we have interfaces like CUDA, like OpenZL, like Petal, mm -hmm. and you have a computational power, the fact that it started as a graphics processing grid becomes slightly irrelevant. No matter what matters is that you get artists to direct, which lets you program, in this case, your acoustic parts. But you use them for all sorts of things. They hide that mm -hmm. and yeah. the GPUs for all sorts of things, not just the uh, audio. But the three dimensions is, is kind of specific. Originally, isn't it? The three dimensions? Well, for doing graphics, yeah, but yes, yes, in yes, terms yes, of the audio yes. stuff, um, the dimension doesn't really make a huge. I mean, the dimension, three dimension uh, stuff just happens to be extremely large. Yes. But it's, it doesn't really, you can have a two dimensional thing which is very large. Mm. As which would be the same as a small 3D thing. So. I mean, you. Were, I remember you were having some trouble organizing calculations according to which uh, the different faces of a 3D domain. That was in the old version of CUDA, right? Yeah. So the the yeah. technology's kind of moved on to make it. But as it CUDA gets more mature, um, it becomes easier to, to actually program to actually use the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, I just had a question whether I understand you use finite different schemes because you can get them quite quite quick. But what about using the lurking methods? Not so much the quickness, but I'm curious if like whether the dispersion. Uh, are, are you talking about working working say over unstructured grids like uh, say or? Well, I'm saying I mean finite element in the case of <coughs> yeah, one well, space and and whether you can or, or even more generally taking certain basis functions for certain instruments. That you, that you tested out. Okay, so for example, that it's, it's, in theory, it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I'll try to tell you in practice why. Actually, in practice, sometimes it's a good idea too. But, all right, so let's take the case, say, of um, a vibrating string, right? So instead of operating over a grid, if you have very simple boundary conditions, we can calculate the modal shapes, which I think is what you're saying. You're talking about a set of basis functions. Yeah. They're actually available in closed form. So it's, there's no work to do in order to get them. It's very cheap. But if you take, say, a plate with free edges, there is no closed form solution. So you have to go and calculate them offline. So it's a big eigenvalue problem, which is not great on GPU. But also, it's very inflexible, because every time you change something about that plate, you need to exit the, the runtime loop, recalculate all the modes, and then start again. Also, there's a real explosion in terms of data, too. So if you wanted to run that way, well, you'd actually have to hold on to not just to the eigenvalues, but also the eigenvectors, right? Which is far more data than, uh, than working this way. Now, the good thing <coughs> is, of course, that if you have that representation available, you can generate exact solutions, at least in the linear case. We can't. So we have all these artifacts that come from the fact that we're uh, kind of getting around this issue. So it's, it's a complicated one, um, but that modal synthesis stuff is doing exactly uh, what you have just mentioned, I think. So, if that makes sense. Yeah? Does it sound significantly different? With your spaces, what if you put an impulse in it, 
and then took the recording of it, then you can yep. get involved with it in real time. Yeah, it sounds that's, different, does it? Uh, no, that's uh, an approach that a lot of people actually use. So you yeah. don't. Okay, so there's two different ways to really use it. You can have a, an impulse response type approach where you mm -hmm. just run it once to get an impulse response, and as you said, convolve it with anything you want. Um, that's totally fine. We tend to use it in a slightly different way, in a more dynamic way. Mm -hmm. So, like I was kind of showing you, you can actually move sounds, uh, positions around, change uh, the readout positions and stuff during the runtime. Mm -hmm. So if you use it as a dynamic simulation, it gives you more kind of freedom to, mm -hmm. to play around with like, movements within the space. <coughs> So the other thing is if you have uh, an embedded object within the room, there is no unique impulse response. So it depends no, no, on what's in no, there. So that's, we're, there's an interaction with them, so it can't really be separated from the instrument itself. So, but yeah, in this case, it would, if we'd gone and calculated an impulse response, run a dry sound through it, it would sound exactly the same. But then we lose flexibility. So we're stuck with that one, you know, whether it was, we want to have them all. We're greedy, you know. So, okay. Uh, okay, any, any last questions? All right. I feel go very, go very go bad go about go this. Go this is now <laughs> five to seven. Leave. So, right, we go should continue to the, at the pub, I suppose. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of an, it's a more of an aesthetic based question on the, on the, the sort of the end, very end of it. So, what you're playing is you're playing as a stereo image of the sound that you put through the process, especially for, the, for these, these changes. Mm -hmm. um, how much control, presumably you've got an awful lot of control over how you're presenting yep. that stereo image. I'm, I'm thinking in terms of would I record a sound in a space with space these or a different sort of mic configuration? And, you know, because it's always at some point a representation that you're delivering through the speakers. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm interested in how much control you've got over... Uh, you have complete delivery. freedom. Like the examples I gave, um, yeah, it was a stereo output where I just chose uh, two grid points that happen to be kind of a headspace apart to give you some kind of representation of you know, a stereo field. But did um, you have any directivity on those points? No, that wasn't using, the, also, the, no, yeah, that was just omnidirectional. But there's a load of work with people doing directional, directionality, uh, microphone pickups. Uh, you can place a binaural head into the thing to get proper binaural outputs. We've been looking at that. Yeah, so I mean the idea is that you have you have all the data you need, so you know whatever outputs you want to generate, uh, you can. So we could, you could you know, use 20 pickup points, you could use directional pickup points. Um, we have access to all of it. So it's very different from something like ray tracing, say, where you, you maybe have only calculated a solution at one point. We have the whole thing. And so, you can move them. Yeah, and you can move stuff around too, so which is good, yeah. All right. Okay, can I just ask one last thing, which is, yeah, sure. a, which is just a point which seems to me like, what are, well, to me, perhaps the most interesting thing here is the potential for what you can do, which is non-physical. And, you know, you say everything's called physical modeling, but what you're trying to do is model, uh, for example, if you're modeling a trombone, and then you've, you've got this massive headache of how do you teach somebody to play a digital trombone, and it seems to me like that's kind of more headache than it's worth, in a way, because you might as well... What was really interesting is would be to create an instrument which was just a digital instrument, which was somehow you know controllable in a digital world, where somebody could learn and, and sort of manipulate in a way that you just can't do it with a physical instrument. But then they would have more in, sort of more intuition about it because perhaps they've actually designed it themselves yeah. or something. Like yeah, that. Albertos. I don't know if you remember Albertos' example. He had three plates. Exactly. This was really, they were really hanging cool. in the air. Yeah. There was air. It wasn't vacuum, so they weren't floating because of being in the moon or something. But he was hitting one, and their only connection was air between yeah. them. And you can extend that. And, and the, the lab instrument that we saw was also one such example. So then, if you remember, an instrument with lots of links yeah, yeah. connected with multiple links. And um, actually, that's the thing that excites me about this project. It's the, the immense creativity which you can exactly. scale. Yeah, yeah. But the issue about control, as Stefan said, is perhaps not quite within our reach yet, not within our domain for this project yet. I mean, the other thing, I have a very extreme bias on this topic, actually, so forgive me. But uh, I sort of feel like that if, you, if it is very easy to learn how to play something, um, then it's probably not worth much. Um, That's true. So I, I mean, but, but it I guess it's it not so much whether it's easy or not. It's whether it is the fact that you have this immense world of potential. You do, and yeah. And more than anything, whereas it's like you could spend all this time trying to play a digital trumpet, or you could just play a trumpet. 
And then yeah. but at the same time, you so, can't, what you can't do in the real world <laughs> is go and do everything else that you can do in your yeah, world. Yeah, so I mean, world. yeah, so we're, we're, yeah, we're trying to do, you know, build, allow musicians sort of more, more kind of a role as instrument builders. Yeah, that well. would, I mean, if, so, if there's some I mean, kind of way to like combine different instruments together and yeah, and mix and match, you know, you know weird yeah. Things. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm getting sidetracked. Uh, I'll end <laughs> right. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, let's, yeah, we won't call it a day there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right.